but it's And I'll have Pamela do roll call. Thank you. President Jennifer Ogden. Present. Vice President Bob Anderson. Present. Garrett Jones. Here. Nick Sumner. Here. Rick Chase, he's in transition trying to call in. Right. Greta Gilman. Here. Sally Lodato. Here. Jerry Sperling, absent excused. Barb Ritchie, absent excused. Council Member Lori Kinnear. Present. Thank you for joining us, Council Member. Always good to have you. All Thank right. You. Any additions or deletions to the agenda? If not, we have someone from the public, Matt Fuller here, to speak to us about the skateboard park. Matt, can you hear me? And you've got the floor. Uh, yes, I do. I, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Matt Fuller. Um, I'm part of the skateboarding community in Spokane. And I thank you for uh, letting me join this meeting today and allow me to make a few statements and questions uh, concerning the Riverfront uh, Spokane uh, project. Um, uh, well, uh, so as you know, the old park used to be, uh, under the freeway park and, uh, it was built, uh, several years ago, uh, to give an outlet to the skateboarders, uh, bikers, rollerbladers, uh, what, whatever have you, uh, uh, to give them an outlet, uh, during inclement weather and at night. And it was demolished back in 2014. And since then, the skateboarding community has uh, attended many meetings to work with the city to help get a new skate park built in place of it. And um, uh, it, it's been great that we have gotten a new park uh, uh, started to get built or the plans drawn up. Um, but the, uh, the chief concern has always been not the design or the size of the location. It has just been that it has a roof uh, so that we could skate it or bike it. Uh, whenever it rains or snows or at night because it had lights. Um, my, uh, my questions are, um, is there a, blue, a blueprint design that I can have access to? What's the layout of the size of the park? Um, second would be, like, do we have any rough estimate on how much it would cost to install, like even a rudimentary shelter over the park? Or can we reallocate any funds to build a shelter or do we need any outsource uh, any outside source for funding for this project and i know that's a lot of questions i just gave you sorry i just had this all in a list <laughs> that's all right these are absolutely appropriate questions first of all thank you for coming to park board because i always like it when our citizens show up and take an active interest like this it always makes our parks better barry you have some of those answers i think Oops, we can't hear you. Barry, unmute. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, I do. And, and I saw Garrett had his hand up, too. So, Garrett, if you want to chime in at any time. Um, Matt, you asked about the location, the cost, and, and if there are funds available. Um, you know, when we were doing our, our uh, the, the location, let me, let, me, let me share that with you first here. Uh, let's see if I've got my... I have an action item that I have to use a map for. So let me bring this up. So here's a, a map of the North Bank um, playground facility, Matt. And what we have is, I'm gonna draw a little bit here. Um, we have a maintenance and operations facility in this location. The entry off Washington uh, Street is right through here. Of course, you can see a rather large um, parking lot uh, with a drop-off zone 
in this location for folks um, coming and going. Right here is a um, about um, six hoops for uh, basketball in this location. And then also uh, we have about an acre's worth of, of uh, playground right over here. And nestled in between all those things, Matt, is the skate park, which is basically in this zone right here. And it is pushed up against our, our bluff, um, big giant rock outcropping. Uh, the skate park, the base bid of the skate park was, you know, what we could get for the $285,000 that was set aside for skate facility was about a 5,000 square foot uh, place. Um, then with that, uh, the park board was able to find some additional funds to uh, expand the skate park uh, to the east and add an additional 3,500 square feet which made the entire uh, skate park itself, which is a central location right, at, right off the main entry of our, of our uh, playground, uh, 8,500 square feet. So it's rather large. Um, the cost of the, uh, of the whole project together is pushing upwards of $500,000. And, and, and with that kind of footprint, if we wanted to cover it, it would be... Um, It'd be a rather sizable uh, fee. We're thinking that it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of about $100 a square foot to put a, put a durable um, commercial grade uh, cover over the, the skate park. And when you do that too, you wanna be able to not only shed uh, the elements off the, uh, off the roof, but you wanna prevent a lot of um, heat gain and radiation back down into the, into the facility itself. So we, we need a, a good, um, robust roof, if you will. It could cost anywhere from, I'm thinking 100 square feet or $100 a square foot. If we did something over just the 5,000 square foot area, we're looking at maybe $500,000 worth of uh, improvements there, which is a sizable um, number. Whether or not there's budget uh, to do that is one thing, but then um, I also have I'm gonna stop sharing here just for a sec on that one. We also have, and stop me any anytime you uh, you want, Jennifer, because uh, I can talk skate park and park all day long. Um, here's an image of the skate park facility in Riverfront Park, and I took some photos of it today. And um, you know, here's a panoramic looking back into the skate park, and what you can see in the center here, Matt, are some light poles. And there's three light poles in there that will radiate light all over the park. And we're also going to have some wall packs, they're called, on the building that will also illuminate the park. We are fairly far into construction. We're placing concrete right now. Um, the steel has been tied in the majority of the area, which you can see. It's an active work zone to, uh, to begin to, to stop this work. Um, this is for the park board too. Stop this work and uh, engineer a uh, cover. Um, I think that it would be it would impact the project um, not only with cost but with time. Anything's possible, but we are uh, we are actively shooting that concrete right now, and the uh, and the skate park's being uh, installed. Here's a view from up above at the sportsplex, looking down at the facility, and. With that, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, be quiet and um, let uh, give back to you, Jennifer. Okay. Did you want to add anything? Sure, I'd love to. Hey, and Matt, uh, good to meet you. I think we've maybe met before. Uh, Garrett Jones, Parks Director. I think, too, going back when we looked at the open houses that we had, when we had the original 5,000 square feet uh, that Barry mentioned, the question was asked, if additional funds were raised, where would we want those priorities to go? And the number one priority was to get that expanded skate park up to the, uh, the 8,500 square foot skate park intact. So that was the number one priority. Um, the other discussion with the group was, in the future, is it even possible to have certain elements that are covered and not necessarily the whole thing, but could we look at certain pieces within the skate park that could be covered as well? And so I think that's another opportunity. Um, we have some great mechanisms, though, in the future when we look at 
outside funding, whether, you know, and, and that is with the uh, Spokane Parks Foundation and the Riverfront Park Campaign, uh, or hopefully in the future, like a Friends of Riverfront group that will be able to raise dollars for capital projects that are high priorities for the citizens and the stakeholders. So um, even if there isn't bond funds available now, this is something that can be constructed later, whether it's a full build out or certain elements that we do have the fundraising mechanism in place to be able to raise dollars for these type of improvements as they become priorities in the future. So Matt, don't let this take the wind out of your sails. Um, granted the bond money looks like it's been spent, but um, to get a, a skate park of the size uh, that we have now. However, uh, fundraising is always an ongoing possibility. So um, if you believe you have within your skate park skateboard group um, individuals, potential donors, uh, relationships with businesses that might would like might come forward in a coordinated way to uh, help raise funds for a roof, um, I'm going to be forming this Friends of Riverfront Park group and I would love to talk to you about that and see if we can get something going. Um, I don't I don't think this is something to be discouraged about. It may not happen right away, right now, but it's certainly something we could shoot for in the future. And that would be wonderful. I, I really appreciate you working with me on this. And uh, I know the, the skate park is being, uh, being shot right now, and this would be a project for way later on. Um, it, it still is a goal of mine as well as the rest of the community. Um, but uh, I'm sure that we could find some sort of uh, donors or – uh, nonprofits or, or something that could help us with this and uh, even be able to get somebody to come out and actually do like a rough estimate on on actually putting in a rudimentary uh, like even half the park or, or part of the park uh, uh, you know shelter so that'd be great um, so here's, yeah. here's what I want you to do make sure that you we have your information you get it to Garrett and staff and uh, we'd like to put you on the roster for friends of Riverfront Park okay that would be Good. wonderful. Thank Good. you. So we'll be talking. Good. Right. Glad you came to the meeting. Yep. Thank you. Thank right. you for your time. Excellent. Your time. Excellent. Okay. Park board members will move on. First of all, anybody else from the public? I don't think I noticed anybody else on the list here. If not, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Are there any park board members that would like any item removed from the consent agenda for discussion? If not, I move that we adopt the consent agenda as presented. I need a second. I second. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good. Opposed? All right. The consent agenda is adopted. Now we have two special guests, Patrick Stryker from Spokane Cox. Hello, Patrick. Hey, how are you guys? Can you guys hear me and see me okay? We can hear and see you. Nice spot you have there. Okay. Good. I'm uh, not super tech savvy, so as long as you can hear me, see, I guess I'm doing okay. I just wanted to take a moment. I'd ask if I could um, have a few words at this meeting uh, simply because I wanted to take a few minutes and tell you guys about some of the great things that we've got going in the parks um, that I think are making Spokane Parks a better place. We've got the Mounted Patrol. This is our third summer now uh, that we've had the horses in the parks, and that is going phenomenally. We have uh, currently about 55 horse and riders um, and we're getting out into the parks um, every weekend, as well as uh, a number of weeks, like actually during the week, we're getting out there. Um, and it's been great. Again, this is our third season, and the horses are such a huge draw uh, for the community members, for the parks. And I love it. One of the things we do in the COPS program is the idea of owning our spaces as a way to fight crime in a good, positive way. And it's the idea that as people, we're usually territorial. And so if we can kind of take over a territory that belongs to the bad guys, um, you know, drug deals, things like that, and, and do it with just good, positive stuff, when the bad guys show up, they, they just move on because we're in their territory. And I can't tell you how many times we've had reports of that, that uh, we go into parks, people tell us stuff they're seeing. Um, so we, uh, I joke that the horses are, they're like the Beatles, man. When they show up because we publicize where we're going to be, a lot of times they show up and um, there's already... 20, 30, 50 people waiting, and sometimes they never even make it into the park because <laughs> everybody is just waiting for them, and they can't even unload the horses because the people are there, and that's a great thing. Um, but when we can, we try and go into the parks to those areas and bring the people with us, and 
just own those spaces. And, and I think it's a great thing. Um, I can't tell you how many people have come out into the parks and um, not only uh, people that have said, you know, they've never seen a horse up close, uh, never touched one. And that's a really cool thing. But people that either have never been to a certain city park or haven't been in years and are kind of rediscovering it, um, we're able to kind of help facilitate that. And then, of course, when we're talking to people, it's what part of town do you live in? Do you know where your neighborhood cop shop is? You have a block watch, and we start asking them about crime things, um, and that's good for us on our end. But I think it's such a great thing for the parks to get people out there and help them feel comfortable and um, and excited about coming into the parks and want to come again. Uh, and that's just been just a, a a great program for us. And again, you know, three years now and still going strong. And we're getting into parks that um, typically don't see events, so um, we're not taking the horses into Riverfront. Um, we do take them into Manitou, but um, you know, South Hill Cannon Park, Liberty Park, Corbin Park, Glass, Hayes, a lot of these parks that maybe don't get some of the big um, high-end business with the, the big events and stuff, uh, that's where we want to be. Um, get in there and get people into those parks, into their neighborhood parks, uh, and it's it's just been great. And so, I, you know, I want you guys to know that, and, um, you know, thank you to you guys for allowing us to be there, and the Parks Foundation, we've they've given us a number of grants um, over the past few years, and so we're able to really advertise for the parks. I mean, that's just been such a cool thing. And now this year we started the off-road patrol, which, well, let's be honest, I, I kind of just wanted to use my ATVs in some of these rural parks, and, and that, let's be honest. But it, it's been great. A lot of the parks, you guys know, Palisades, High Bridge, um, Peoples, you know, up towards Beacon Hill, Minnehaha, you get some of these parks that, for being city parks, they're pretty rural, um, and it's great. They're beautiful. I uh, love them. But you get off the beaten path a little bit, and you get a lot of stuff going on. Um, a lot of the, a uh, lot of drug deals, uh, illegal camping. We find I don't know how many needles on any given weekend and stuff out there. Um, just a lot of stuff going on, and then of course that activity spreads out into the residential areas, um, and so some of these areas become real hubs for crime. Um, and so we've been able to get out there. Um, and just have a presence. And just like with the mounted patrol, these are volunteers. Nobody's armed. Uh, nobody's making arrests or accosting people. And so especially now in this time of really questioning the role of police and things like that, I think it's great that we're doing what a lot of excuse me, communities want to see, which is making use of civilians and not armed, uniformed police officers to get out there. Um, it's funny with the off-road patrol when we uh, roll up and we see people walking I always know that in their minds they're going, oh, great, who are the jerks on the ATVs? And so whenever we come up to them, you know, we shut off the ATVs and just chat them up for a couple minutes, let them know what we're doing. And uh, the response we've gotten has been very positive. Um, just this weekend I was chuckling because we pulled up on a husband and wife uh, that were walking down there. And I, I said, you know, I just wanted to talk to you, tell you what we're doing, because I know when people see the ATVs, they and I think we're a bunch of jerks out there screwing around. And the wife starts laughing. She goes, that was what my husband just said was, who are the jerks on the ATV? Because I said, yeah, that's why we like to tell you what we're doing. And, um, and so once we talk to them, let people know that we're there for them, um, that, you know, the parks should be places where they can walk and play, you know, uh, Frisbee golf and all these great things that people do and, and not feel scared. You look at the break-ins and the uh, trail heads and stuff like that in the cars. We want people to know that that's um, – what we're trying to help out with, and so it's been a great response, very positive from people out there, um, and it's been very good, the stuff that we're seeing and able to report. Um, uh, just today, we went out actually with Justin Worthington, who's the head of the um, uh, Park Rangers. He's the supervisor. Great guy for uh, his park sport. I think you should know that. He is awesome. We went out with him today, let him see what we were doing. Uh, he showed us areas of parks we hadn't been. We showed him areas he hadn't been. Uh, great thing. He even gave me a little... Uh, I don't know if you can see a little um, park ranger badge there that I gave it to my son. My son loved it. Uh, so a really great thing. We've got a great partnership, I think, now with the park rangers. Um, obviously, the NROs for SPD know we're going out there. They've come out with us um, on occasion just to see some stuff. But mainly, it's just the volunteers, and I like that um, because it is just volunteers. We're able to um, interact with people in a good, friendly way, and even some of the stuff that um, – Maybe isn't as good. Obviously, we're keeping our distance from, but if we do talk to people, it's uh, always positive. Just today, we um, were out in um, Highbridge Park. Uh, one of our folks went around uh, to a um, far-off area and found uh, there was a gentleman who 
appeared to be experiencing homelessness, and he was not in good shape. Um, and she saw him, and so we were able to call 911, um, open up the gates, let the ambulance come in. And, um, you know, I think, gosh, if we hadn't been there, um, he, he was not in good shape. He couldn't remember the last time he'd had anything to eat or drink. Um, and, uh, you know, if we hadn't found him, um, would anybody have? Or would it, the wrong people maybe have found him? I don't know. And so we were able to uh, kind of help deal with that, get him to some resources and um, get him some help. Uh, we just today we came upon somebody that was graffitiing um, the the big trusses that the uh, railroads are on um, down there in High Bridge, and uh, Justin was able to have a great conversation about, hey man, I love artwork too, but let's not do it this way. If you want to do some artwork, let's find a more productive way than spray painting and tagging everything. Uh, really positive interaction there, I thought, and so um, we're doing a lot of great stuff for you guys in the parks, and I love Spokane Parks. I love how easy the Parks Department is to work with. It's been uh, nothing but positive on our end. So I just wanted to take a few minutes and um, just update you guys on that and let you know what we're doing and, and how highly we think of uh, the parks employees that we're working with. Well, Patrick, you're my hero. I have to say that my brother and his small children were visiting me last weekend at Safe Social Distances, and we took a walk in Manitou Park and came across the Mountain Patrol. And okay. um, my nephew doesn't talk much. He's terribly, terribly shy. And he opened right up, talked to them, petted the horses. He just bloomed. It was wonderful to see. And there must have been 30 people in line to pet those horses. Yeah. They were just surrounded. So it was a wonderful, positive experience. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. good, good. Okay. Anybody else have anything for Patrick? Otherwise, keep up the good work, my friend. All right. Thank and you, you so guys. Thank you. We have Thank such so great much. parks. We love them. All right. Uh, so we'll move on then to Jerry, who's going to speak to us from Spokane Youth and Senior Centers Association. And he's got pictures. <laughs> yes, I do. If I can get them up on the screen. Hi, everybody. Um, good to be with you. Um, my name is Jerry Andrew. I am the director at Hilliard Senior Center here in Spokane. I've been the director here for 22 years now. So kind of like the furniture around here. But anyway, I um, wanted to take an opportunity <laughs> to um, update you a little bit on senior programs. Um, it's been a odd year, as you all know, um, from our standpoint. And in fact, I think I'll just go ahead and share my pictures if I can. Um, there we go. And Jerry, this is Garrett. Are you bragging with your trophies in the background? <laughs> well, I, I was... Um, you know, I was really hoping that they were showing off, are they? <laughs> That's our, uh, believe it or not, if you saw that, that was our, uh, this is our Croquet League uh, trophy. And we share the winner on the back all the time, uh, every year. So anyway, <laughs> not bragging. Uh, I represent the uh, six different uh, senior organizations uh, here in town and um, probably more consistent stuff right now between us than there usually is because obviously uh, COVID is a, is a big thing. So uh, obviously senior centers in a time of COVID has been really weird and rec uh, recreation looks a lot different in 2020 than it did uh, in any of the previous 22 years that I can remember um, being here at the center. Um, as far as all the centers, I'm going to share just kind of a a few consistent repetitive uh, comments from them um, just simply because you're, you're probably going to hear a lot of uh, repetitive points as I go through them individually. But um, obviously our centers have been really impacted like everybody else financially. It's been a, it's been a tough year. Um, we're trying to remain vigilant and survive our time uh, during this pandemic crisis. Uh, most of us beings that we are dealing with, with the you know the most vulnerable population, we're focusing right now um, almost exclusively on wellness. Health and wellness uh, is really really important when you run senior centers, and especially um, when you've been closed as you know shut down as as long as we've been. Um, and so we we really have to spend a lot of our time focusing on the people um, because without the seniors, there is no program, there is no centers. Um, one of the other things that I thought was great is the creativity of the center staff and the volunteers um, during this pandemic 
with some of the things that they're doing operationally. And of course, you know, the other thing that um, I noticed from everybody's points is their appreciation, obviously, of uh, community partners. And of course, you, the park, park board, um, for your funding that you provide to us because it's so important. So um, with that in mind, we'll just kind of buzz through. I'll try and do this quickly so you can get on with your meeting. Uh, Corbin Senior Center, um, they have been basically almost in a reschedule mode for a lot of their travel. That's that's one of their big things is the travel program um, and have either rescheduled into fall or have canceled many things uh, at this point. Um, all of us continue offering newsletters, keeping our, mental, our members mentally sound and connected to our centers. Um, they are doing a rummage sale, an upscale rummage sale. I, I don't know if it's happened yet or if it's about to happen. Um, I believe one of the neighborhood groups are doing it in conjunction with them, helping them um, raise funds you know, during this time. They were able to keep their thrifty uh, boutique shop. Um, they were able to get that open here recently, which kind of assisted them financially um, during this COVID-19. And uh, their volunteers really have, uh, I think you'll see consistently between centers and things that many of them are either updating their facilities or doing things to improve them um, as, you know, rather than sit on our hands most of the time. So um, there, a lot of them are doing uh, painting projects and, and whatever they can to improve their facilities. Um, as I mentioned, they're staying connected through social media, newsletters, phoning. Um, probably the consistent thing that I'm hearing from all of the centers uh, is the inability to host fundraisers. That's huge to us. Um, and so we're all kind of working creatively to uh, work on fundraising ideas as we go forward. Project Joy is our senior entertainment group. Uh, again, hit hard because of uh, COVID, uh, simply because many of the senior facilities are, are just basically closed. Um, some of them they can't even get into. Um, but their staff continue, like all of ours, our staff continue to be at our organizations operating our offices, and we're either doing it from home or offices. We're all typically doing newsletters, um, working on new websites. Uh, that's what they are doing right now. Um, they have been creative and been able to do some entertainment um, through some outdoor live performances, uh, of course, with social distancing in place. And, and one of the things that I thought was really creative, uh, they've created their own YouTube channel. Um, for these facility managers and also for individuals that can follow them and, and enjoy some of these performances online. Um, they are doing some small rehearsals with groups um, and practicing for their performances that will be coming up, uh, you know, in the future, hopefully. Uh, Mid-City Concern Senior Program Downtown, um, they have really kind of suffered from some bad luck. They, they had a facility roof structure problem um, that basically was going to close their facility regardless. Um, it just so happened COVID happened at the almost the same time. And so um, that kind of forced them into that mode of closing down to repair um, their roof and do some structural uh, things to their facility. Um, again, their staff remain around doing uh, wellness contacts and, and creating goodie bags and things for their, for their seniors. And um, like others, I think, again, the, the, the main thing that I'm hearing from all of them is fundraisers just haven't been available or even possible. Most of them canceled or rescheduled. And that really, really impacts our programs uh, severely. Um, one really positive thing for Mid-City is even though their facility has been closed down, their Meals on Wheels lunch program, they've been able to partner and move up to the Southside Senior Center Kitchen. And uh, they are extremely thankful to them for their partnership as, as well as many of the centers who are sharing things and whatever we can do to get through this time. So uh, Cinto Senior Center, again, they're using the downtime to upgrade or update their facility projects. Uh, they're doing their gardening. Um, they are doing exterior painting to their building, resealing their ballroom floors. Um, again, their staff are communicating with their members through emails and 
website updates, Facebook posts, phone calls. Um, they're also working on future plans for um, their trips and tours and uh, vehicle social distancing. And you can see a picture, I think, in this screen of their new van that's down at the bottom of the, of the page there. Um, so they're kind of gearing up for hopefully being ready for the days that they can open up some of those trips and tours and the things that they are, are looking forward to offering again. Like all of us, they you know hope to be able to resume daily operation inside of our centers uh, as soon as possible. Um, Southside's doing a lot of crazy and creative things like collecting dog food from the Humane Society and uh, providing that to their members for their pets. Um, they have small groups that are meeting out on their patio and again, all in social distancing kind of thing. Um, they have members making masks for other seniors. Uh, they're connecting with their members through the email blasts and all kinds of different things like that, making phone calls. They're using their vans to pick up items and take members to appointments. Um, they're, as I mentioned, they opened up their kitchen to uh, Meals on Wheels downtown. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, another organization that slips my mind right now, but um, another organization that does meals for seniors. Um, like most of us, they continue to print their monthly newsletter to keep their members kind of um, in touch and familiar with something. Um, they're actually doing some fundraising online, selling uh, items on Craigslist and Marketplace and, and kind of giving their, uh, their members the first shot at them by appointments. And, uh, and they're opening up their computers and their reading libraries and uh, puzzles available to their members. Um, their volunteers are, again, like many of the facilities, are, are helping out with their ground maintenance and their gardening and, and things like that. And I know they have a big fundraising sale uh, online one that they will have coming up uh, very shortly. So uh, my center, the Senior Center at Hilliard, um, we've been doing a number of different things, but really focusing again on well, wellness and, and, and taking care of our, our members. One of the uh, programs that we're co-oping co with uh, the, our congregate meal site, the Valley Meals on Wheels, is a uh, lunch program called the, um, oh, something in my mind, Garrett, you're right in my way there, the Diner's Choice Program. There we go. Um, and, and what we do, basically, we are partnering with local businesses, uh, restaurants, um, to basically provide meals to seniors um, for a coupon. A lot of that is funded through federal funds that are helping uh, to make sure that seniors get meals uh, every day. We are naturally a congregate meal site, so um, this is kind of a bridge during that time when we are not able to offer that. Um, our staff and volunteers are heavy into that program, uh, heavy into still working our office, doing social check-ins, um, really for the purpose of uh, you know, helping seniors to avoid the depression. That's, that's a really big deal when, when you're dealing with uh, senior programming. Um, we're doing shopping for seniors with our vans, uh, providing needed care items. We're co-oping with uh, First Interstate Bank, providing all kinds of care and food uh, packages for needy seniors. Um, we're providing recreational board games and puzzles and books and cards, crosswords, um, we're, we're also doing online entertainment links to uh, classes like art, art classes and videos um, for museum tours and fitness classes and live streaming uh, video concerts. I actually did one myself uh, on our Facebook page as well for our members. Um, and our fall really has our staff working on kind of non-face-to-face -face fundraising ideas um, we've been coming up with all kinds of things that we can do. Um, we do a senior pledge campaign where we're actually approaching our members um, to help us out as much as possible. So during COVID, it's, it's extremely important that we try to be as creative um, with not only our programming, but our fundraising ideas as we're rolling through the uh, second half of 2020. So um, that's kind of a quick update. I hope I haven't been too long. As always, I would say, and we all say, thank you so much for your support. Um, together, we do good things together, so. Thank you, Jerry. Sure. I appreciate your creativity and coming up with ways to keep people's mental and physical health intact. These are really challenging times, and I think they're about to get more challenging as 
unfortunately, opportunities to be outside are going to be limited by weather. So what you're doing is really important. Um, stay in touch with staff because I think we're going to take more looks at that uh, uh, down the line. Um, so might be able to even pull in some other partners on that. So awesome. anyway, um, good work. Keep up Thank the good work. All right. So now, Mark, you are up with your financial reports. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, if uh, but the technology will cooperate, I will share. Okay, can everybody see that? <clears throat> okay. Well, as Jerry mentioned, this has been an extremely unusual year for everybody. And what we'll see as we go through here is we'll see the same pattern in July that we've seen in uh, some of our previous months. You know, compared to our historical budgets based on a two-year average of, of past budget usage, we will see the actual significantly below the averages for both expenditures and revenues. So beginning with the park fund, we'll start here looking, comparing our expenditures to our historical average, where it's obviously historically or significantly below the historical average. Actuals are about 71% of the budget. Um, this is obviously due to many of our programs not being able to, to be um, in, in operation. So we have very minimal temp seasonal usage and also a concerted effort from every, from every department at cost containment and control. So that's really definitely showing up in, in these statistics. Um, moving on to revenue, we see some of the same things, uh, definitely below the historical budget. It's about 87% of the historical budget. Um, again, obviously this is due to our greatly reduced program activity and thus our revenue generating capability. So, um, however, when we compare our actual expenditures to actual revenues, um, we see that our uh, revenues are, are quite a bit above our expenditures. Uh, for example, in July, just July alone, our uh, revenues were about $290,000 over our expenditures. So we've had seven straight months of surpluses. Uh, overall, year to date, our uh, revenues have exceeded expenditures by about $2.15 million. You know, and again, I compliment park staff for being very diligent about watching every expenditure, and it's made a huge difference, and has definitely improved the financial position of the parks fund this year. Um, so, um, any questions before we move in to look at the golf fund? Okay. Golf fund, golf has had a very good year. Um, we do see our year-to-date expenditures below the historical average. Um, this is partly due to the COVID closure, but also to the close monitoring and expenditures use of temp seasonal labor. So that's definitely showing up in the Gulf Fund also. However, when we look at revenues, we see our revenues have exceeded our uh, uh, year-to-date revenue budget. Um, the uh, you know, even even with the, the partial closure from COVID, uh, it's been a bang up year. Every, uh, people have definitely been coming out to golf. So it's very, very, very good news. Um, and then final, when, final graph, when we look at the uh, revenue, year to date revenues compared to expenditures, um, we see that our year to date revenues have exceeded our expenditures by about $1.1 $1 million. Revenues in July alone exceeded July of last year, comparing month to month by about $108,000. So um, it's been a very good year for the Gulf Fund. Any questions and about the any of the statistics for the Gulf Fund? Yes, I do, Madam Chair, if I might. Yeah. This is Lori. Um, hi, Mark. I, I'm not sure if this is for you or if this is for Garrett. I'm wondering, does uh, do the Gulf courses vary in year to year um, in terms of when they open and when they close depending on weather. So would that have an impact on um, your revenues? And, like if we had a, 
a year where the, the courses could stay open longer, then I would assume that would have an impact on the weather. Or do the, do they close right at a specific date? So every no, year is definitely it's very weather dependent. And as I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the course is open a little bit later. No, they opened a little no, bit later last year. Isn't that correct? Yep. We opened in February, but then we we actually had to open and close like three different times yes. during all of this. And then we had like this late snow in the spring and we had a close and then COVID hit. And okay. um, yeah, 2019 wasn't the best revenue year no. for us no. overall, but it's a good benchmark knowing that we're down, you know, we we're offline for six weeks. Um, and usually we know how good of a season we're going to have in about June, um, you know, really where you can make up your, you know, if we have a really good spring and a good summer months, not a lot of smoke, that is awesome. You know, and then fall people tend to kind of switch to fall sports and you're moving into football mode. So it'll be interesting what happens this year. Um, yeah. but usually we do consistently close roughly around the same time in the fall. Great. Thank you. Okay. The last slide here just is a brief, uh, recap of the uh, the bond fund, our expenditures to date, um, and our, our commitments or our uh, encumbrances to date. And right now our balance in the bond fund is about $910,000. So we are working the balance down and, and making some good progress. So that basically concludes the Brief over high level overview financial report. Is there, if there's any questions or concerns, I can move on to the next topic. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Okay, so Mark, that concludes your report there. I goofed. Um, Kate Green is here, the Executive Director from the Northeast Youth Center, and she was going to present after Jerry, and her name was in the fine print on the agenda, and I skipped over it. My apologies, Kate. You have the floor. All right. Thank you. Let's see if I can share. All right. Does everyone see that? All right, so um, I'll be talking about uh, West Central, um, South Spokane Community Center, and then Northeast. So we'll start out with West Central. And so they had definitely COVID um, hit in the, and they had some delays in rescheduling for events. Um, one of their biggest events is their Building Dreams uh, fundraiser that was scheduled for March 21st. So they were right there when, um, Everything shut down, so they rescheduled it, and they're doing a virtual event on September 19th. Um, and I'm sure there's still tickets available if you go to their website, and all the information should be available there. Um, and then they also had to reschedule for next year their first responders luncheon and their neighborhood day. So those will be in May and June of next year. Um, when when everything hit, it looks like they had to shut down. So um, they shut down their center and um, their schools, the youth development program closed and they jumped into gear helping out and doing some stuff for the community. So uh, it looks like they were delivering food um, in partnership with the Bite to Go program. Uh, they partnered with Papa Murphy's to deliver pizzas to their families they serve. Uh, they collected donations and delivered Easter baskets to the children in the program. Um, the staff were um, making sure they were checking in uh, weekly and making sure all the families, if they needed anything, they were taken care of um, and meeting their needs through phone calls. And um, they did a, a spirit week through social media for the families and they got participation that way. So they were able to keep the kids engaged. Um, and then they delivered signs and goodie bags to the seniors in their teen, um, from their teen night program. Um, right now they are up and running for summer camp. So they're serving about 27 children um, a day and they're looking um, to open childcare for the school year and fill that gap um, 
and the kids aren't going back to school. Um, so they'll be, they'll be busy there. This is such important work. Yes, there. can you see that better, larger? So um, at Southwest Spokane Community Center, they've been um, busy providing activities uh, for the kids. They um, provide breakfast and lunch, and then they're just keeping them busy and engaged and entertained the best that they can. Um, currently, they're serving 20 kids in their summer program, and I believe that they will be um, continuing programming into the school year. Wow, that's so impressive, especially difficult when you have to maintain distance and watch for infection protocols, et cetera. I'm really impressed that they're able to do that. Absolutely. Wow. Um, that's, that's definitely one of the, um, the struggles, but it looks like our centers are doing the best we can and making it work. So we have to be able to keep, yeah, we got to keep providing. Yeah. So um, Northeast, we um, continue. We never close. We closed for a week in March to make sure the facility was sanitized and um, to create spaces for the children when they came back. So we um, closed down for one week and we went um, back full gear on March 23rd. Um, we helped provide an environment for the children learning while um, their teachers uh, weren't able to do so. So we had education, art, music, and physical fitness. We served upwards of 50 children each day during the spring. Um, we prepared grab-and-go meals for families that uh, needed to continue to feed their families from home but weren't participating in, the, in our program. And, and um, we served a hot breakfast, lunch, and snack to our children that participated. Uh, we made sure all the children got Zoom meetings with their teachers. Um, we communicated daily with their teachers, making sure that they were um, up to date on their school and that they weren't falling behind. So that was a, that was a huge um, undertaking on our part, but it was something we definitely needed to do for the kids in the community and um, hopefully it pays off. And now um, summer's here, and so well, our motto is COVID won't stop us. So um, we've, we've been able to safely take the kids on uh, various outings, rock climbing. We um, met with the Mounted Patrol at um, uh, Jim Hill Park. Um, we had the Spokane Police Department come and, and serve a meal to the kids, and uh, we've, the parks have been amazing to us. This is our outlet, being able to get in there and take the kids daily to the different parks in our neighborhood. Um, and so we've had great um, working with Jennifer and Al that we were able to get a sprinkler set up at Harmon Park so the kids can run around the sprinklers because that's one of the biggest things they miss is going to the pool. So um, that's what we're doing on hot days is pulling down the sprinkler or having a fun water balloon fight. Um, we're currently serving 70 kids a day uh, in summer and we're gearing up for the school year. So um, we're anticipating about 100 kids uh, will be enrolled daily um, for summer. So we've been busy. You have been, been great. Do you have special needs kids in your programs? We um, we have behavioral needs children in our program. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, there, there you are. Our special part hit by this. So thank you for the great work you're doing. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. All right. So we'll move into committee reports now. Um, we did not have urban forestry this month, but we did have golf. Bob Anderson. Hello, Bob. <laughs> Can you present for Thank golf? You. I think hey, I turned on the video. Gee, I have to do the mic also. <laughs> uh, the golf committee met through WebEx on Tuesday, August 11th at 8 a.m. Chair Jerry Sperling was unable to attend, so I was so I was the chair pro tem for the meeting. Golf has one item, and actually it fit well with the consent agenda, but Mark Poyer provided such an excellent learning experience for the golf committee members. We asked him to share this presentation with the full board, so take it away from there, Mark, if you would. Thank you, Bob. I will attempt to show screen now. Bear with me here. Can you guys see that part? Oh, 
Okay, does everybody see that okay? Yep, thank you. Looks good, Bob. All right, great. Well, thank you, Park Board, uh, for ha having me here today. And uh, for, your rec for your consideration, I have a recommendation of a, a golf course equipment purchasing plan, which is a lease-to-own plan. Um, and and the, the two major players in the, the golf course equipment game, let's say, is, is Toro Company and John Deere. Now, I know you, most of you have heard of John Deere. It's, it's an old, um, you know, family uh, organization that's been around forever, mainly in the ag industry. And um, a little bit of background on both companies first here is, is Toro Company really, um, you know, strives to make golf equipment and, and they're, Golf equipment really encompasses more than 40% of the industry that they're in, which is basically like making a brass. The roots date back all the way to 1914. And you see in this picture, this is actually a, the first invention happened in 1919 that Toro came up with, with the first machinery to mow uh, fairways and greens at golf course. It's pretty cool there. Um, I'm not going to say that some of our equipment looks that old, but it sure does look uh, look old. Let's just say that. So um, they pride themselves uh, with a tradition of quality. Uh, again, they're an innovator of the golf course equipment and uh, and turf units. Uh, they also do some landscape landscape contracting. And uh, most of you know that with with the irrigation systems put in at Esmeralda and Indian Canyon, they also are in a leader of uh, the irrigation solutions. And all of our heads, the heads that irrigate the, the two new irrigation systems that we have are Toro brand. So that's also um, a, a good little tidbit of information there. And th they really care about their environmental footprint, which, you know, reducing emissions and conserving water is also one of our main goals here at the city. Um, John Deere, again, a company dating back to 1837, they're more geared towards agriculture and construction. Um, they also dabble in, in log garden. You know, oftentimes if you have a riding lawnmower, chances are it's probably a John Deere. They also do forestry and involved in the uh, government and military side of things. And they just recently, maybe in the past uh, decade, maybe 15 years or so, have uh, dipped their toe into the waters of making golf course style cutting units, which I'm going to refer to as triplexes, which is a three um, of a three reel system that mows our greens, which is arguably the most important cutting surface, um, you know, that we have in our golf course. So moving on, a timeline of things that, that happened just to show you guys, that, you know, this is something that we just haven't been thinking about recently, but dates all the way back to the summer of 19, when we did equipment quality analysis and the amount of downtime some of our units will have, are having. And um, also this is when uh, the first, uh, group buy or tour lease. We 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 leased two pools of of equipment in the past, and the summer of nineteen is our first tour lease payment ended. Fall and winter of twenty nineteen, we had communications with the equipment vendors to request a quote for the needed equipment that we're about to replace. Um, March obviously pandemic hit, purchasing freeze, city golf shut down for roughly five weeks. And moving on to May and June of, of this year, we had a chance to demo these pieces of equipment, each piece of the equipment that I'm recommending to purchase now. And uh, we really had a chance to compare apples to apples with, with the cutting units. So, you know, a John Deere triplex versus a Toro triplex, a, uh, you know, a tank spray versus tank spray, a really good chance for our superintendents to get out there and put their hands on these pieces of equipment to, um, really make a good judgment call for a better way to go. Uh, and finally, in, in July, this year was with our meeting with the final meeting with the selection team to choose the best product. Also noted on the bottom, our Jacobson lease, our second pool, um, those payments will end February of 2021. Our selection team consists of myself, our four head superintendents at each golf course, Larry Marsh, our equipment manager and shop foreman, uh, Mark Buning, Director of Budget Finance, and finally, Thea Prince, our Senior Procurement Specialist. In the end, Toro was selected. Um, their proven quality has unanimously chosen um, from the group. Also, the comfort and ease of use of each piece of equipment was also a plus. 
uh, product support was was also there with their machinery with uh, their shop just located north of it on the golf course. So it's really easy to get those replacement parts and um, any needed uh, needed aspects for any of the machinery that we have. And also, I'd like to add, you know, 90% of our current golf cutting units, which encompasses the triplexes, the rough cutting units, and the, the trim mowers, they're already Toro. So this selection with Toro really translates into a seamless transition from old units to new. Um, we do have some parts compatibility there as well, which is a plus. Um, what Toro provided us was, was an extra set of triplex uh, cutting units per machine which equates to about $50,000 value. They also threw in a third year warranty that they believe that's a $7,500 value. Um, Toro is also a big supporter of the First Tee of America, which all of our golf courses have. And in, in particular, Qualchin is the home course or mother course to the First Tee of America in Spokane. Um, they also have a great no pay to pay um, program where if we, um, if, if this, if this proposal is approved, that we will, we will receive these pieces of equipment in September, but we won't pay till them until May of 2021, which is great. So total savings here, with our bundle pricing and our um, other incentives comes to, uh, you know, $97,029, which is a nice savings there. Uh, a little bit about purchase price. Just because uh, City of Spokane is a partner with Omnia National IPA contracts, we don't have to go through the three bid rule. Um, this allows the city to access the most competitive prices available, which is roughly 22% off this price. Now we come to the why. We have aging equipment, well past life expectancy. This this causes trouble with with some of the you know with the safety of our employers, mainly the tank sprayer. Um, it's, it's really old and, and requires our employees to climb a, a ladder in order to dump, um, you know, chemicals and, and harmful fertilizer, harmful chemicals and fertilizers into the, the hopper, which um, is not always the easiest task. And also being proactive, to avoiding catastrophic failure. That means hydraulic leaks, engine rebuilds, engine failures, and so forth. And then um, obviously the downtime that I talked about with, with our aging equipment, that they, they experience a lot of downtime. Parts break, things wear out, they're always in the shop getting fixed. Very costly, um, also costs our staff valuable time and also morale. And it's very hard to, to maintain the level of turf quality with, this, with these old pieces of machinery, um, which also um, has a direct impact on customer experience in the golf course. So in these next four slides show real pictures of our current cutting units that I'm proposing to replace. The next picture to the right of it is the power meter. Now, this is where it gets confusing, and I and I try to to convert these hours into miles for you guys to kind of see the the difference here because I think everybody relates to the miles on their car or vehicle that they drive every day. So first, this here any canyon that I'm proposing to replace is. Um, is two triplexes, and and the first one is is 3,718 seven, hours past its life expectancy. The second one is a little over 4,000 hours past life expectancy. You know that I converted the miles, the total miles on these, um, are well over 500,000 miles. So if you can imagine having a vehicle that was 500,000 miles on it and still running, it is a um, it, it's quite the feat. Uh, for downriver, we have uh, a complex replace and a tank sprayer. There's a nice picture of that tank sprayer there um, with that with that tank really high off the ground. Uh, you know, having our employees get up there on the ladder to dump those those uh, chemicals in is quite a burden. Uh, that tank sprayer is 19 years past its life expectancy, and the tri triplex is a little over 2,000 hours past life expectancy. Qualton has a rough mower. That's roughly 1,600 hours past life expectancy, and, a, and another tank sprayer that's um, 20 years past life expectancy. Now, I couldn't use the same uh, hours to miles translation with the with the tank sprayer because it doesn't have an hour meter. So I just went on the normal 
USDA kind of recommendations on how long a tank sprayer should last, and, and this one's well past its life. Esmeralda, two triplexes there. The first one being 5,700 hours past life expectancy, and the second one th about 3,800 hours past life expectancy there. Now, I wanted to find a way to quantify what these new pieces of machinery will do for golf. And that mainly is the condition and quality and, and how the ball rolls on the putting surface, which is the greens. So what's often used um, across the board uh, with the USGA is what's called a stamp meter. And that measures, quantifiably, it measures how far the ball rolls out from the feet of the greens. And, and uh, the number one feature a golf course is judged on is the green condition and speed. You know, in layman's terms, fast and smooth is good, slow and bumpy is bad. So what we did was we conducted a test and we mowed three different greens at Esmeralda Golf Course with our old Toro Tripe mower and with freshly sharpened wheels, adjusted bed knives, all comparing apples to apples. And then we mowed another with that new Toro Demo Triflex that we had just to see if we can quantify a difference here. And we did. Best we could get with the old equipment was an average of 9.1, and with the new equipment, that's 11.1. So it's a two additional feet of out from your ball, which really is, is an outstanding um, <laughs> change there. I, I was really shocked when I saw that number. Just an average on the floor, um, those greens average about a 12 on the stent meter. And then obviously when you get up to your major championships, Masters, U.S. Open players, and PGA, those are average about a 13 or 14. Now, I'm not saying that I want greens to roll 13 or 14 in the stamp meter because that'll be counterproductive, making these greens too hard to play for our everyday public. But it was a really good way to quantify what this new equipment could do for golf in Spokane. And it's also the people's. Here is a slide here with um, we took a vote when we were doing the Canyon uh, improvement and we asked the public to prioritize their ranking. And if you look for one, uh, number one on the list there, both with our superintendents, pros, our golfing public, public excuse me, greens were, were number one on the list. And, and every piece of machinery here that I'm proposing to purchase, minus um, the rough mower, has an impact on greens. So the re replacement and the cost is shown on this slide here. Like I said, Fulton, I'm proposing a new rough mower and tank sprayer. Indian Canyon will get two green mowers. Down over, down over golf course, we'll get a green mower and a tank sprayer. Esmeralda will get two green mowers. And then one shareable piece of equipment. This is nine total units. And that's a top dresser, which, which, uh, which spreads and broadcasts sand on the greens um, to better their condition. The total cost of the units, tax inclusive, is $361,595.37. Now on to the financing. Uh, five annual payments of uh, just over $79,000 $79, per year at a 3.4%. And like I said before, this is... Um, a really good opportunity for us to receive these goods as early as, as of September of this year, but not have to pay on them until May of 2021. Now, these next two slides I'm going to show you really, really breaks down and, and gets to the nuts and bolts of this brief presentation. Like I said before, we've taken out two pools of lease to own agreements. Uh, the first one from 2015 to 2019 with Toro, the amount of 250000 change there. The second lease uh, from Jacobson happened from 2016 and it will end February 2021 for about roughly the same price, $216,000 for that pool. I'm proposing, proposing here a, a, a new lease agreement that will start after all of our leases have ended, so this is a completely new one, um, for the amount of $361,000, $595.37. If you look on the graph here, you'll see in 2015, we had a yearly payment, financing included, a little over $46,000. In 2016, 
Toro and Jacobson came on. There was a little overlap there. That jumped up a little bit. And from 17 to 19, we held over $93,000 in lease payments per year. That's financing, everything included there. And we did that just fine. It bumped down a little bit. And again, here's that February 2021 stat. That last lease payment will jump off. For our seven-year average, being right around $66,500. And lastly, this last part, my proposal, annual payments with tax and financing of $79,059.22. In summary, what we're going to get, again, our seven-year average payment was $66,528. Proposed new annual equipment purchase lease over the next five years, $79,059.22. For really a net expense impact, to the golf fund per year for the next five years of $12,500.02. This is nine total pieces of brand new machinery with a three-year warranty, and the payments will begin May of 2021. Any questions or comments? Good presentation, Mark. Uh, one of the things that always bothers me is when we buy new equipment, and I'm all for this, uh, because golf is our money-making asset right now, and so many new people are coming into golf. It's wonderful. But one of the things that always bothers me is how exposed some of that equipment is when it can't be locked up because we don't have proper storage sheds to secure it in. I know that um, vandalism and theft is a problem up at Esmeralda and even at Colchan. And so if there's any way to, in the very near future, find some money to give a couple of security sheds to those places, it would be nice to protect the equipment. I agree that would be nice for you. Very good suggestion, Jennifer, and thank you for the presentation, Mark. I I hope it has information as all as it was to me. Um, if no further questions or comments, I will move that we approve the Toro Company equipment purchase for city-owned golf courses, totaling $361,595.37, plus financial fees, tax inclusion. Second. All right, it's been second. Any, any further questions before we put it up for both? Those in favor, say aye. Wait a minute, we have a question from Washington. Did we have a question? Sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. sorry. I was still on the bill. Sorry. Um, what happened to the old equipment? Great question. So old equipment, well, some of the old equipment is so far past its, its life expectancy that we might have to part it out and, and put some of the, the older reels on better pieces of machinery, but that will go into a bank of kind of our backup singers, what we use as a backup. And uh, we will store those here at Park Ops, and that way all four courses can, can, uh, can use those pieces of backup machinery as their best piece of machinery that, machinery that they use every day will, would go down, if that would go down. Now, with these new pieces, with that three-year warranty, we don't expect any issues. Thank you. This is Nick. I'd be a little slow on the uptake, but the net savings is based on over the last lease. Can you explain that to me? Is, or what was that net saving based on? Yeah, that net. Yeah, Nick. That net saving. That next. It's it's really a twelve thousand dollar uptick per year based on our seven year average of lease payments with equipment. We've had two pools of equipment that we leased: one from Pearl, one from Jacobson. So if you average that seven years. This is really only $12,000 uptick per year. Okay. And then is there any concern as the SIP loan payments, you know, increase as we do more improvements? Say that one more time. As we do more improvements, our SIP loan repayment costs will increase as well. So is there any concerns with, with adding additional spend? No. Okay. There, there are two different funds. Yep. There are two different funds, Nick. So we're not utilizing the the uh, facility use fees for this. This will be come out of their, their operating capital. But there was, I don't remember the, the utility, 
the facility use fees, we're going to cover the entire payment in the future. Is that, do we think it will? Yes, I think, I think it will. And that's, that's a, maybe a Mark Beating question too. I mean, and that's all dependent on, on play, playability throughout the year, too. Right. So. Okay, just curious. Any further questions or comments? All right, it has been seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. The motion carries, and thank you again for the great presentation. Thank, thank you, Mark. Mark. Golf is having a, an excellent financial year, as Mark pointed out, with total revenue of 15.7% for July and 4% for the year. Operating expenses are down 4% for 2020. And for this to occur during a year where courses were closed temporarily, during the peak period illustrates the excellent management our courses are receiving. Our golf staff has performed exemplary service between the current equipment for working well past its recommended service life. The six mowers being replaced averaged 3,731 hours past their recommended service life, while the two sprayers averaged 19 and a half years past theirs. It's amazing that our courses have been maintained as such high standards while working with outdated equipment. The most exciting golf story to me is the rebirth of junior golf at our Spokane courses. With July participation, the highest ever at Esmeralda and where our other courses reporting similar success. Our golf pros and staff are increasing marketing and providing more leagues and playing opportunities for junior golfers. And as we all know, junior golfers are the future of golf. Sean provided a summary of marketing results from TV ads with specific emphasis on economic impact of golfers from outside our region who travel to Spokane and spend time and money in the city. Another very important factor when measuring the value of parks to the Spokane economy. The next scheduled golf meeting is Tuesday, October 6th at 8 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Great job. All right. So, Greta, Land Committee. Hooray. Oh, hi. Let me turn on my camera for this. Um, yes, Land Committee had no action items. Can everybody hear me? Um, we had... Uh, Four discussion items. We looked at a, a, a change order at um, Dutch Jake Park uh, to eliminate a port in place for the ground surfacing. Um, it's not in there now, and, and so far people are happy with it the way it is. Um, so we, to save funds, we um, are looking at not replacing this at the park now. And I think it did, wasn't an action item because of the price. Uh, is that right, Nick? Nick on the call? It was a, uh, yeah, Greta, was, uh, ah. Nick, it was, it was a deduct of just over $100,000. And because of the nature of it being a deduct, um, we, were, we were told it didn't need to be a park board approved item, but we felt with a $100,000 contract change, we should make everybody aware of it anyways. So, uh, Yes, that's an uh, informational item. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, thanks for jumping in on that, Nick. Um, then the Angel Spell came and we discussed the High Drive Trail Bluff names. Um, Friends of the Bluff have been working on names and they have some, some recommendations and alternate names for um, several of the trails on the South Hill Bluff. And I believe we are going to bring uh, names land committee next month and um, probably to the full park board next month as well. We looked at the upriver park of Vista recipro reciprocal agreement where um, we basically give Vista an easement to 
construct improvements on some park property uh, near their headquarters. And similarly, they give us um, some easements as well over there. And last but not least, um, Dan Buller and Kyle Tuig presented an overview of a proposal to put a water tank in uh, Amblin Park. And Garrett, I didn't quite catch at land what the next steps on that are going to be. Um, could you fill us in on what we're going to see next on that issue? So yeah, perfect. That's great. I think uh, next steps. Sorry, there's a lot of um, um, we'll, engineering will now take a look at it because as a committee, we did not say no. Um, and so what we'll do is engineering with utilities will now start reaching out to community members, stakeholders, neighborhood group, uh, city council and others to see what the next steps are and then come back to us as a committee and park board on those findings. And some of that is going to be, uh, what are the impacts gonna to be to the existing site? And then also what are the opportunities gonna be? Um, because there could be quite a bit of efficiencies with this location, which means there could be additional funds that could be infused into our park system, into this neighborhood um, to go back into those improvements for the neighborhood. So um, those are really the next steps. Now the ball is back in the engineering's court to come up with a process and community outreach and then come to back to us on what those findings are. Great. Uh, thanks, Garrett. And that covers uh, land committee last week. And the next committee, land committee meeting is 3.30 p.m. on September 2nd. Hard to believe it's almost September. Great. Thank you, Greta. Sure. Thank you, Garrett, for the information. Uh, Rick, you did not meet, but Sally, did you have anything you wanted to say? I'm sorry. No, I'm a little slow with the mute button. No, I don't have anything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now he had the Riverfront Park Committee, but it went through finance. Nick, did you want to say anything or just let Bob take the floor for a minute? Uh, I just want to say thank you for doing that with me being out. And uh, the next Riverfront Park Committee is scheduled for September 8th. Great. All right, Bob, Mr. Anderson, you have the floor again. Oh, you're back with me again. Um, the Finance Committee met Tuesday, August 11th at 3 p.m. Um, we had a combination of consent items and other action items to be brought to the board tonight. So let's start out with those. Uh, Jonathan, if you will start us out with the, the first action item that we need to vote upon. Absolutely, Bob. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm bringing today um, an agreement between the Spokane Parks Foundation and GARCO for recognition on the elevated experience. I first well, I want to say that this is, uh, we have so many great community partners at the park and we really cannot do the programming and the recognition that we do at the park without our community partners. Um, the foundation is certainly one of those partners, and through the foundation, over the last couple of years, we have uh, administered the Campaign for Riverfront. The Campaign for Riverfront has brought uh, great treasures to the park, such as the Providence Placecape, uh, the Hooptown Court, uh, and others, um, and we'll be doing a new park campaign here soon. So this is an extension, this agreement here is an extension of the Campaign for Riverfront through the foundation. Uh, last park board in July, uh, you approved uh, the park director to uh, implement the charitable donation from Garco Construction that's donated uh, in value of $130,000. Those improvements included an opening on the east entrance, an expansion of the south entrance, an expansion of the northwest entrance, and a standpipe uh, a dry sand pipe that helps with uh, providing better fire protection through uh, the pavilion. All those implement, all those changes have been completed to date and they're great. Uh, we really could not have done it without Garco, so we really appreciate their charitable donation. 
that donation came in through and accepted by the foundation, uh, and which in turn uh, came to the park as the recipient. And our our agreement with the foundation allows us to receive that gift. Uh, so this agreement today um, is not an approval of the agreement, rather it is an acceptance of the agreement uh, between the foundation and GARCO to recognize GARCO on the elevated experience for their donation. Um, and so the language that you see in that agreement details that relationship. Uh, I want to make sure that there were some earlier questions about signs, uh, and so I want to make sure that we separate process from the agreement. Um, so what we plan to do is work with GARCO like we have done with Providence and like we are currently doing with uh, HoopFest to develop the sign after the agreement has already been in. And then we would bring back that sign to the park board for review. Uh, and so that is what this, uh, this briefing is today about, this action is to really recognize officially that the elevated experience will be renamed something to be determined. It will be Garco fill in the blank. Um, so we will be working with Clancy and the Welsh family to determine what that uh, name would be called. And then also we'll be working through with them on the signage. Um, and then we'll bring that signage back to the park board for final review. Do you have any questions? I want to say thank you again to Garco for the gift. It's tremendous. It was an amazing opportunity. It certainly has provided us. So if no further questions or comments, I will move the. I will move that we approve renaming the elevated experience at the U.S. Pavilion in recognition of Garco Construction's charitable donations, as outlined in the gift agreement between Garco Construction and Spokane Parks Foundation. Is there a second to that? I'll second, Lori Kinnear. Thank you, Lori. Any other further questions, comments? Thank you to the foundation for their part of this, their partnership. Exactly. All right, if, if not, nothing else, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? It passes, John, and uh, well done, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. All right, we will move on to our next two action items and uh barry i guess you get to be the uh, center of attention for these next two so please take it away with the first one for the la river north bank change order number four thank you bob um change order number four encompasses a lot of uh 12 different items and some of those items are reimbursable or funded by non-bond sources um, we have export of uh, lead contaminated soils um, from impacted, what we call impacted soil, which is just slightly dirty. Uh, we want to get off site. Um, so those things are actually eligible for um, EPA reimbursement up to the amount of about $55,000. Then we have uh, other items too, um, such as uh, uh, a new roof over our uh, expo shelter, and that is actually um, funded by uh, by the Parks Foundation. They're going to give us thirty five thousand dollars towards that that new roof and structure there. Hooptown USA is uh, kicking in nearly eleven thousand dollars to upgrade their sound system, and the ability for for that sound system at the, at the courts um, to be remote controlled uh, from an iPad or. A, or a telephone, a small computer, as well as still having the uh, opportunity to uh, use it as a, as a PA system and, and, and have other power there uh, for, for, for any kind of event, a small, a small show of, of any type could be there. Um, but I will go down and, and just share a couple things with you. And I, I brought this map up earlier of our North Bank uh, playground. And um, I'll, uh, I'll just draw a 
couple quick lines for you. When we did our, uh, our knocking down the old uh, M&O facility, it was full of asbestos and, and whatnot. We even found mercury and stuff in there. But what was there that we didn't expect to find was in this area, we found a bunch of lead. And that's, so we needed to get that out of there. We also found lead in this location. And being an old railway area and whatnot, um, we're not sure how that lead got there, but it got there. We wanted to get rid of it. We also had some uh, permit changes uh, along the storefront of our maintenance and operations building. And this was really comes out of our design review uh, at the city. And they just asked that we doll it up a little bit. And so we did that, and uh, and it's going to turn out really fantastic. It's actually uh, the O&M facility is arriving on site um, as we speak. It, um, it's going to be erected here over the next few weeks. We needed to get rid of some rock and debris. We always have that on these projects. It seems like uh, in 1974, just dirt and debris was brought in and planted over. So um, we don't, it, it's not good for, the, uh, uh, for our new improvements to have that debris under there. Uh, so we, we needed to get rid of it. Um, we did do some stormwater improvements that I won't go into a bunch of detail on. Um, we did have to do a little bit of work here on the skate park, a uh, little added work there, um, so that it doesn't push against our O&M facility. We just wanted to make sure that everything was going to stay put without adding any kind of uh, a lateral load to the building. We have a separate budget altogether for IT. Um, and this was supposed to be an owner furnished item and not only IT or our, our network and connecting to it, but also our security system, our, our alarms, uh, fire alarms. So out of that separate budget, we'll pay for uh, item number seven, which is IT and security systems and the amount of 44,600. Um, we also needed to remove some more boulders from site. And then I have this one too. We wanted to place one of those um, yellow riverfront signs uh, out on Washington Street. We really wanted to do it on, uh, on an angle facing the intersection at the main entry there at North River Drive, but with so much uh, uh, new um, light poles and, and signals and, and switch gears that needs to go along with that, it was visually going to be obscured. So, if we place it on Washington Street, it'll be nice, bright, and very visible. And it'll look just like our other ones that are at uh, Mellon and Howard and, uh, and, and Howard and Spokane Falls Boulevard. Like I mentioned before, uh, this little shelter there, thanks to the Parks Foundation, uh, they basically saved it. It was on the chopping block, and it is an expo legacy, a contributing resource uh, to, our, uh, to our city. And then we have a, a small little detail uh, for removing some debris up along the bluff up here. And so we got a small bill for that. All in all, uh, change order is for $273,792.23. Over 100,000 of this is reimbursable or non-bond funds. And then um, we'll have a project contingency left over uh, anywhere from around, I don't have all the fine uh, uh, numbers yet, but somewhere around 200 to 250,000 left for additional um, uh, changes in the future, unforeseen, or just uh, simply added added value um, in the in the North Bank Park. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, um, but I um, I would appreciate your approval on uh, Tila Riviere. Change order number four. Any questions for Barry? I know you always do such an excellent job with your presentations. You seem to answer the questions in advance. Thank you, Bob. All right. If no questions or comments, I will move we approve the La Riviere North Bank change order number four for $273,792.23, tax inclusive, from Administrative Reserve and non-bond funds. Yes. Is there a second to that? I'll second. I'll second. 
All right, any, it has been seconded. Any further comments? All right, all those in favor, please respond with aye. 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 All those opposed with nay. It passed unanimously, so thank you very much. And Barry, you uh, will be up again. Let me get out here what you're going to be up again for. Okay, there it is. Um, it's a move to approve Riverfront Fund Redevelopment Budget Am Amendment Number 11 and an un unencumber Park Fund Balance Reserves. So we'll let you take that away and provide further explanation. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, in our in our finance committee, um, I'm showing the document that was presented at that time, and it kind of got uh, it got tweaked a little bit in committee. Um, so rather than going through you know, exactly what's in your packet, because I gotta I gotta update it just a little bit, I'm gonna summarize it here for you. And what's uh, what's going on is you know budget woes are everywhere, and and the bond. Uh, we've been so careful with our with, with, with our with the bond funds, um, mainly because we, we keep running into things that are unforeseen, and so we squirrel away cash in certain areas. Uh, we have ten percent contingency. We have five percent contingencies over here. We put money into what's called an owner management reserve. That is completely just a back pocket, just in case fund. And as we're rounding out these last few projects, we're seeing that these funds can be used uh, for other projects, other capital projects. So, what we'd like to do is, as you mentioned, um, the park fund currently has dog eared uh, $285,000 to replace the under the freeway skate park. And so in, instead of using park funds for that, we're proposing that, you, that we just use bond funds to pay for the, 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 the base bid portion of the, of the skate park. So the first reallocation would be just simply 285,000 from a particular contingency, the North Bank contingency, North Bank 5% contingency, and just slide that up into our construction budget. So 250,000 goes right into construction from our contingency, pays for the skate park, releases of your park funds, um, that 285,000 of park funds. And then we have another project coming up uh, in the future that are you know, struggling to, to make sure that we can redo uh, the North Suspension Bridge Redeck project, which I think the, the suspension bridge has been closed for almost a year now. The deck was literally falling off uh, into the water. So uh, Nick, Maud, and Garrett have got a, a good plan on how to um, rebuild that with some, with some uh, competent engineers. And, and uh, they went out to bid once, and the uh, uh, bids came in crazy. So they, they rethought it through, uh, needed a little bit more budget, and going to put it back out to bid. So we'd like to dog ear some of those funds for that uh, for that suspension bridge. Um, it's on the island known as Sanumane. And so we have a budget for Sanumane. And the budget right now is about zero. So we wanna slide these funds from the North Bank and a little from West Avenue um, and from some other you know, banks and, and, and slide those into the Sanumane budget so that we can help out with that bridge. And so um, remaining in the North Bank 5% contingency is 33,000. If we move the 285, there's 33,000 remaining. So we'll just shift that over to Sonoma. West Havermel, we have 67,000 there that we can push over. Um, there was a uh, uh, urban forestry tree allowance that uh, has been rethought and I, it was on the consent agenda to fund that over uh, um, four years with the uh, capital plan. Um, and then we, like I mentioned, the OMR budget, owner management reserve, we can, uh, we feel confident that we can um, move 65,000 out of that budget and, and, and set it aside for the, for the Sanumane budget or the North Suspension Bridge. What that does is it, it, it puts about $415,000 towards the North Suspension Bridge. All in all, the uh, total reallocation is 700,000. 
comes out of various pockets and that or budgets in the bond just sorts to funnel through and take care of the skate park and it takes care of the suspension bridge and and basically we're improving one asset um out of out of funds that we would have otherwise you know looking for a home for anyway i i've said a lot if you have any questions i'm happy to answer them so barry if we have any leftover money from the bridge you think it can go toward roofing the skate park it certainly could, um, because I, um, in the small print that's above um, here, Jennifer, it says that as long as the bond, as long as the bond uh, projects, North Bank, West Havermail, if they're if they're done uh, per the plans, then we can put that money toward any any other capital improvement project within Riverfront or in other parks. So right. I appreciate yeah. that. Just thinking that Matt was correct when he talked about how the usability of the skate park would be so greatly increased by a roof. So yes, yes, and it'll be a warm skate park. I mean, it's a, it, it's all concrete. There isn't hardly any shade. We snuck in some trees, but it's um, it's going it, to they probably benefit from a roof in the future. Any further questions for Barry? Again, an excellent uh, presentation, Barry. Thank you, Bob. If no questions, then I will move we approve the Riverfront Park Redevelopment Budget Amendment Number 11 and Unencumbered Park Fund Balance Reserve. Second. Any, any other comments? All right, it has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, respond with aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, that also carries unanimously. Thank you again, Barry. Um, Thank you, Bob. I'll briefly summarize the, the Finance Committee meeting. There was quite a bit of activity. Uh, Ryan Griffith presented a new five-year contract with TPC Holdings to publish, print, and arrange the mailing of the Park and Recreation Quarterly Activity Guide. The current five-year contract for 39,000 annually is less than our just completed contract of 55,000. This was approved and sent to the board as a consent item uh, for the consent agenda, which you approved earlier. At the July Park Board meeting, a motion was approved to accept the donation of in-kind service work valued at 130,000 from Garco Construction at the U.S. Pavilion. At the August finance meeting, John Moog presented a promotion to approve granting naming rights for the elevated experience to Garco Construction. Finance committee members did express some concern that the park board review process for signage should be in the agreement. The gift amendment, though, was approved and forward to the board with additional language to be added, granting park board review before the signage was installed. We appreciate your efforts on that, John. The meeting was then turned over to Barry Ellison, who presented four action items for approval. The, the first being the law Riviera change order number four for changes to the North Bank playground, consisting of 12 value added improvements. This motion was approved and sent to the board for final approval. The Riverfront Park Redevelopment Budget at number 11, reallocating funds from current RFP budgets to other projects, including the North Suspension Bridge. Although this bridge has received funds from the West Central TIF, the City Council, and a state grant, additional funds are needed to complete the repair. Barry and Garrett assured the Finance Committee that no funds from the original bond would be used for this repair. That motion was also approved and forwarded to the board for final approval. The Riverfront Tree Mitigation Amendment, this, this amendment changes funding source from bond funds to park funds and adds language, language allowing parks to plant replacement trees on other parks pro property, not exclusively at Riverfront. The motion was also approved and that was added to the consent agenda. The final action item, the SPVV amendment number three, 
adding funds for design and engineering of identity signs for the Providence Playscape Playground. This is a non-bond non fund expense gifted by the donor. This was approved and added to the consent agenda. Jennifer, in one of our discussion items, Jennifer Ogden developed a written statement relating to the selection of the artists for the second art piece at Riverfront Park. Pamela has included an excellent summary of this statement and discussion in the Park Board agenda for today's meeting. I suggest reading that if you haven't already. Results of a public survey will be provided to the Riverfront Committee at the September meeting, and a choice will, will be made then between the top two art pieces. This recommendation will then be forwarded to the September board for final approval. And finally, Mark Bunig and Jason Conley presented an overview of the 2021 budget and asking for finance committee suggestions. The 2021 parks budget will receive the full 8% transfer from the city, and that's based on the 2019 expenditure budget. So that's a very similar number to what we have now. It is expected that funding for 2022 budget based on this year's sales tax revenue will be substantially reduced and parks will need to build reserves to cover this anticipated change. Suggestions were made that preliminary budgets be developed for full to limit operational scenarios, much like we experienced this year. The next finance committee meeting is scheduled for September 8th at 3 p.m. That's all. Thank you, Bob. Well then. All right, we're going to move into reports and I need to talk to you about something that you will see in your emails. In the emails for the Beaver, there is quite a bit of suggestion from artists that our Beaver artist, uh, Saya Moriyasu, has solicited uh, in support of her work. There is quite a bit of suggestion that Spokane Parks um, has erred and been even unethical in its treatment of her. I want to respond to that. At no time has any member of the Spokane Park staff or the park board contacted the artist. That is the job of Spokane Arts. They are contracted to be the liaison between the city and the artists that submit proposals for artwork in the city to be funded with public funds. The job of Spokane Arts is to issue those proposals, to gather the information, to make that available to the Joint Arts Committee for recommendation, to then take the, artist, the recommendation of the Joint Arts Committee back to the artists and let them know the results to then stay in touch with that artist about what our process is, about where we are in the process, and the timeline for how that can happen. Somehow that communication between Spokane Arts and Sky Morris Moriasu had broke down, and she evidently is operating under the assumption that she had a verbal contract in April to proceed. So she did proceed on the work. She is now asking to be paid for what she did seeing the possibility that the beaver might not be chosen as the final piece. The city cannot gift tax money, public money, without a contract. At the same time, she never had a contract to proceed. Again, she had never any, any confirmation or communication from park board or park staff. So there's been a tremendous misunderstanding, and it's very, very unfortunate. I feel for her, and I'm very frustrated for her in that. So that's what's in the background of some of those emails. But I wanted you to know that Spokane Parks and the Park Board has not erred in their behavior on this. It is also not contrary to our process to ask for public opinion. When we went through the pavilion validation, we extended that public opinion piece by three months. When we looked at the rides, you'll remember that Hal McGlathery had a whole t-shirt audience full at the park board meeting uh, asking us to rethink the rides in Riverfront Park. And so because of that public opinion, we rethought that. Ultimately, we made a budget decision on that. But um, built into the process is the um, ability for the public to make comment. Now, the Joint Arts Committee was open to the public, but frankly, until artists are selected, the public doesn't usually weigh in. They're not going to spend their time going through 28 artist proposals. Um, and 
There is built into the process then for the public to come to Riverfront Park Committee and then to the Park Board. Granted, with the COVID situation, access to our meetings is a little more difficult. Technical difficulties, we have all experienced it, so you know about that. So asking for public input in a survey is quite appropriate, especially, I think, in these times. We are one-third of the way through our process. Um, the Joint Arts Committee is going to meet again on, on September 3rd to see and to confirm the ranking of a second artist so that Riverfront Park has a choice because of the very many emails we have received on the Beaver. Riverfront Park Committee will then make a recommendation. It will come to Park Board for a vote in September, and we do need to vote and decide this. So that is the process we are in. And I needed to fill you in on the background because of what you're going to be reading. Are there any questions? Garrett, do you want to say anything? No, you did wonderful, uh, Jennifer. I would just say from the staff perspective as well, um, you hit it right on the head as when we're using public dollars for public space, we need to have public comment on those types of decisions. And this happens on every single project. Um, as the pavilion was a great example. So um, I would just continue to state that, n you know, no decision has been made. There has been no uh, piece that has been uh, brought forward for that decision in either case. And so we look forward to the process and we'll continue to work with all the artists um, on win-win solutions in the future. So stay tuned. Um, we're, we're so hopeful and very positive through this process. But yes, there has been a, quite a bit of miscommunication and Jennifer, you've done a wonderful job of summarizing that. All right, Greta, anything from Conservation Futures? Uh, yes, yeah, the, the news I have from Conservation Futures is that um, the City of Spokane Parks and Rec Department with funding from Conservation Futures closed on 38.3 acres of property as part of the Make Beacon Hill Public Project, and that includes the Paris property and the Collin property up um, in the Beacon Hill uh, area that we've been um, discussing as of late at Park Board. So um, we own it now. Great. Yes, that was my report. Great. We don't have Jerry with us today for Park Foundation. Terry, did you want to say anything? Um, well, first of all, just really want to say a special thanks to John Mug for leading the charge with Mel and Marco to get the gift agreement executed. Um, I feel like I'm breaking up. You are, but keep talking. Sorry. And the other thing is that thank you to Garrett for taking the lead in behalf of the Public Foundation and actually spending the time with Clancy and Tim to make the suggestion about the possibility of running that gift, that in-kind contribution through the foundation. So it can be credited for the campaign for Riverfront. Um, but in addition to that, it falls in under the, the contractual obligations that the foundation has with the park board for recognition opportunities. So I felt like those things were very, very important. We worked diligently with our um, parks and rec division staff to ensure that we are following following all of the policies and procedures that the park board has set in, in motion and that they follow daily. So I think that that was really, really important. Um, in addition to that, just a little PSA, we've been uh, participating in Working Women's Wednesday with Molly Allen the, the last two weeks, and we've got two weeks to go for the month of August. We are focusing very significantly with the assistance of um, not just the city of Spokane staff, but our community partners on our drowning uh, prevention coalition. And um, in addition to that, my role in the, the online broadcast is really to talk about what's happening in parks and what are the opportunities. So I've been pleased to be able to share with our community that we did release grant funds based upon the modifications that city staff worked, I believe, very, very hard on to develop and figure out safe, um, social distanced, masked ways for people to actually get out and recreate this summer, um, which we all know is just this unique challenge for everyone during this time. 
so um, we were able to talk about the Cornhole League, which is really just kind of fun, and um, talk about being able to fund therapeutic recreational services, which is also just something that's so unique and, and fascinating. And in addition to that, I did have a wonderful uh, conversation last week with the folks from Shane's Inspiration, um, actually it's in, in, in Inclusivity Counts by Shane's Inspiration, or Inclusion Matters by Shane's Inspiration. And so one of the things that we talked about was these potential programming opportunities in the future will be challenging so long as we're in phase two. And so I'll be working very hard in the next week or so to connect our fabulous Parks and Rec programming teams um, to see if there are some ways that we can actually look forward to once the Providence Playscape is open um, to really have some organized uh, programs happening that perhaps could potentially be co-branded and, and perhaps even partially funded through the foundation by Shane's Inspiration. So those are just some exciting um, developments. Um, and uh, additionally, we are really starting to ramp up our text to give campaign through Give Butter. Uh, we are also working on a fairly significant list of potential dog park donors. So, yay! I know, it's very exciting and people are so excited and we have so much momentum right now with regard to that dog park. And really and truly, when you look at the things that we're able to do safely, socially distant, um, and somewhat, you know, in a healthy manner, we're all walking our dogs right now. Our dogs have never been loved more. I mean, <laughs> so so the, sooner, the sooner we can get, you know, we, we feel like we're going to need, what, three hundred and fifty to $500,000 because we want to make sure that we have funds left in the pot to create some programming opportunities. And John Moog's team is very, very fun and creative. That's not my forte. Um, and are coming up with some really awesome things that we'll be able to do. So, anyway, thanks for giving me just a few minutes. It's, it's good to have you here. Yeah. Thank you. Good to have you here and able to speak on that. And glad to hear about the dog park. Bob Anderson is going to be so happy, right, Bob? I am very happy. Thank you. That was that's the best news I heard the entire meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Come here. Scary. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy about the dog park too. My dog is outside my office door guarding me as we oh, speak. So, uh, um, so a couple of things. Uh, if you've been driving around, you might have noticed some of our parks that would have seasonal 20 mile per hour signs now have 20 mile per hour signs year round. So uh, Comstock, um, some of the uh, one's on mission, and that was largely driven by our neighborhood councils who were seeing more and more people out in parks as COVID really solidified in our, in our um, community and wanted to keep people safer. So council went ahead and did a resolution based on the input from neighborhood councils, and we have certain parks in all of the districts that will have a two-year pilot for 20 mile an hour. It, it has been not without controversy because people don't like to go 20 miles an hour. But in actuality, you are only losing three seconds per block. So when you think about that, you're not going that much slower. It's not going to make you late for that appointment. Uh, in other news, uh, we're going ahead with our fuel and fire mitigation project using goats. The contract is done. It's just in its final draft. The first area would be uh, Brown Hangman by the golf course there next to the homes. Use about, I think, 150 goats for that one area. And then, and Garrett's excited, I can see that. And then we're going to be uh, going up north, both northeast and northwest in it next year. So that's an exciting project. And for going north, we're going to use probably more like 400. Goats aren't good for every location, but they are good for situations where it's dangerous or difficult for people to go. 
and they are managed 24-7 by their human and by dogs. So, and they're fenced, so they're not just let loose, go eat. It's very much a managed project. And then two final things, we've had issues with Coeur d'Alene Park and uh, Garrett, I think you were at that meeting today. You'll probably talk about that. Um, and that's been an ongoing problem. I'm not gonna talk about it, steal Garrett's thunder. And then other issue is around the median that Parks manages uh, Riverside by the cathedral. And we're gonna be meeting with Father Connell next week to discuss ways to mitigate some of the camping and issues around needles and human refuse that is happening there. So I'm anxious to get back to City Hall and it doesn't look like it's gonna be anytime soon, but uh, it's nice seeing you all in, in virtual reality. So that's it for me. That's great information. You know, there's an abandoned alley behind my house that the goats would just have field day in. But anyway, it would be about five minutes. There you go. Okay, Garrett, you're on. All right. Well, thank you, um, Park Board. Um, just a couple of things to, to add on what uh, Councilwoman Kinnear was talking about. Uh, we had a great meeting today. Al and I were a part of it, and it was around the um, – setting up a coalition. There's been some food distribution that happens in and around Coeur d'Alene Park, uh, outreach for the most vulnerable and homeless, ex human, or people that's experiencing homelessness. And so we want to work with the neighborhood and all these organizations and church organizations um, on a, a coalition of keeping our parks safe, uh, clean and, and healthy for all, but also trying to find opportunities to support these individuals. So. Um, and then just overall in, in the department, um, again, when we talk about our 2020 budget, it's pretty phenomenal to think that since March, every projection that we have had monthly, we've either, either hit or have exceeded. And, um, and this goes to thinking innovative, our staff, uh, our staff being our, 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 one of our top priorities with the safety and maintaining our full-time staff. And that means we're doing different things. Our volunteers, we have um, volunteers now at Manitou, the Friends of Manitou group. We have adopt a, a block on the boulevards, uh, Manitou boulevards to help us out water and maintain some of those facilities. So we cannot do that uh, with, without all our, our great staff and our partners and really sets the foundation for next year into 2021. And with that, I wish I could nominate every single staff person that we have for the employee of the quarter. Um, but we had an opportunity just this last week um, with our department head meeting, one of our quarterly meetings to uh, nominate quite a few park staff. And um, the first group was the temporary shelter program where we had park employees from park operations help the downtown library uh, location for a temporary shelter, and then also a Spokane County owned facility on the Lower South Hill to provide temporary sh shower and restroom uh, opportunities in these uh, shelters that saved the city a tremendous amount of money. Um, this happened last minute where our team thought very innovative and were able to step in and get the job done on time. And that was Ed Anderson, Jesse Jones, Reed Lawton, Mike Shearer, Mike Dewey, and then Mike, uh, then Matt James Taylor. So those, um, that group was nominated for the employee of the quarter. Also an individual that stepped up from the very beginning to help the emergency operations center was Rhett McCall uh, from Riverfront Park. So he stepped up, he uh, supported uh, this regional unit uh, for quite a bit of time, long hours, different type of work and um, and just a phenomenal job and, and the commitment that Rhett gave us for that program as well. And he was nominated for the employee of the quarter. And then also the last nominee and, and then the winner of the city uh, employee of the quarter was Jock Oaks, our aquatics recreation supervisor. And, you know, Josh is one of the most positive people I've ever met. And, and this time where we didn't have a real answer to anything, we had plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G, for trying to open up aquatics 
And while at the same time, these aquatic centers needed to be opened, they needed to be maintained, our assets needed to be um, kept up, and we did that without any temp seasonal staff, and Josh did a phenomenal job, uh, and the mayor's team picked Josh Oaks as the employee of the quarter, so we just want to gr congratulate Josh for that as well. And just, again, I wish I could nominate our entire staff. Um, it's one of, been the, one of the, I feel like I'm the luckiest director in the world, quite honestly, um, because everybody has stepped up to the plate. Um, and with that, a couple of great uh, other uh, improvements. The Eat, Eat Good group has started in the um, skate ri Numerica Skate Ribbon. Had lunch there today. It was great. It was awesome. It was busy, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, Isidore, the white elephant, has now made its journey down into the Louvre carousel. Um, so that's great. And um, just a couple things to keep on, on, on the back burner. We're going to have a uh, in the works a media tour again for the North Bank to, to get our community out there because there's a lot of cool things behind the scenes that are happening on that North Bank. And so we want to be able to share that. Um, and then also, uh, we had some volunteers and we're able to turn on our water feature at Mirror Pond. We had some plant growth where we had volunteers go out and rake and remove the, the plants. And so um, that facility is looking great. We took the mayor out there this last Friday and gave her a tour uh, with her and her staff and all positives and really wants to thank the park board and the staff for everything that we've done during this time to keep these assets uh, up and running. So with that, that is my report. And, and um, I just said it in the chat, but uh, our park index is just the best. That's the way it is. So other cities have to be envious. All right. Um, let's see. No executive session. You will see correspondence in your emails. So at this time, if nobody has anything else, I will adjourn the meeting at 531. Thank you, everybody. It was a good Thank meeting. You. We got a lot done. Thank you, Jennifer. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much Thank for all you, you do.